Well, good morning all. No. A very warm welcome to our celebration service this morning on our 90th church anniversary. What a joy. And may the glory be given to God who has kept us through all of those years. Not that I've been here all of those years, but uh, I've been uh, privileged to look back on those years and collect together some of the information about how we got where we are today. And we'll be seeing a little bit more of that uh, in a short while. We do particularly welcome any visitors amongst us, uh, whether you're on holiday or uh, other reasons for you to be in our lovely town. And we pray a blessing on you in your stay in this area and with us as a fellowship. Uh, it is our anniversary service and as such, uh, there'll be various different kind of things happening as we go through our service together. We particularly want to welcome Dr. Ray Evans and Jenny um, with uh, our great love. We have various links with the church, Grace Community Church at Bedford. Uh, we'll be asking Ray some piercing, uh, intelligent questions in a little while, not. Um, so we'll be finding out a little bit more about um, who he is, if you don't know him, and what he's, what he's about. And uh, it's just great to have you with us and to uh, hear God's word as you bring it to us a little later. Following the service, uh, there will be refreshments in the room upstairs and uh, we have a special anniversary cake so another incentive to join us afterwards don't run away uh, have uh, a tea or a coffee or a cold drink and have a bit of our celebration cake uh, so that that will be upstairs uh, in the hall after the service and then we meet again for worship here at six o'clock this evening hopefully as you came in if you didn't get this online, you will have received one of our notice sheets. If you didn't and you want one, please ask on your way out. It gives you all of the information about what's going on in the church, not only this week, but in uh, the weeks to come. And it also has some uh, hints for pray prayer, uh, the prayer diary there. Um, there are some interesting requests, like for the summer camp, they're looking for unwanted long sleeve shirts. That's not something you hear very often, is it? So read that, take note of what's in there and uh, use it for your benefit and your information. OK, well, let's commit our morning to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, for the years your hand has kept and guided, we give you our thanks. Those of us who are yours, who have been walking with Christ for uh, maybe a short time, maybe a longer time. We are conscious that it is by your hand that we are upheld. By your grace, we are yours. By your love, we are one. By the cross of our Saviour, we are forgiven. And by his risen power, we continue in his ways. And so we praise you for every blessing that you have brought upon us. We thank you that you have been pleased to grow us in our numbers uh, that you have given us this building and now with the extension all by uh, your hand and we pray lord for your blessing as we continue to walk with you we ask that this place may be a place which is known for truth and love the truth of the word of god the love of christ in preaching the gospel to the unsaved those who are far from you and who need that salvation and lord if there be any here this morning who do not yet know Christ for themselves personally. We pray that this might be the day, this anniversary, which will be their first anniversary, the day of their new birth, the day they come to know you. So we commit our time to you. We pray for your blessing as we worship. Pray for us as we sing, as the, for the musicians as they play. Inspire them, Lord. Help them to lift our worship. And all in all that we do, we pray that we may glorify Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. As believers in Christ, as we move around in our lives, different places, different times, maybe through the country, maybe even through the world, one of the things that you note is that whenever you meet other believers in Christ, there is that oneness, one church, one faith, one Lord, and it's almost tangible. Uh, you sense that as you join in fellowship, even for the briefest of moments, with someone else who knows your Saviour as their Lord. And it's delightful, isn't it? It just uh, makes our hearts full of joy 
uh, and it brings a smile to our fa uh, our faces uh, and uh, it's so we, we end up doing the do you know or did you know so and so from whatever and you make all these connections and links and you see how small but how great the uh, the Christian world is in the body of Christ well let's come to God again in prayer let's pray together one church one faith one Lord our Lord how we praise you for that fact that throughout the ages from those first days of the Christian church that unity has been preserved although we look around us today and we see many signs that maybe that is fragmented and it seems to us there are various denominations various calls various emphases nevertheless those who believe in a risen savior who are his for eternity share this in their heart of hearts that they are saved by grace through faith in christ alone and we praise you that that is the strongest link that any of us can ever have what a blessing it is to belong to such a family uh, a spiritual family one that is alive in your presence one that is bid again and again draw close come near to the living god the creator of the universe the ones to whom the hand of the risen savior is stretched out in love and welcome and we praise you lord for all of those years through which you have brought us as a church we thank you for keeping us we thank you for providing for us we thank you that you continue to do so and so as we turn our eyes from the past to the future we look forward to what you will do we pray that this might be a place where people can come and know that they are welcomed into the eternal habitations of god that they can know uh, constant union with you life-changing power that can rescue from them from the dominions of darkness and bring them into your glorious light enrich our fellowship today we pray help us to be seeking ways to stir up one another in rejoicing in christ in our knowledge of him and in love and in good works so we commit our time to you this morning in his name we pray amen, amen. Well, we have a, a bit of a review. This uh, is just a few minutes of some of the early days uh, of the church. And it's been a delight for me to actually in, inform myself of things that I didn't know about how our church started. Of course, I wasn't here then. I've only been in, in the area about six, seven years. Uh, so looking at some of those early days, it's, it's intriguing to see the faithfulness of God in the lives of, of people who were determined that there be a witness. <laughs>
Well, I hope you were focusing on the words that you were singing, but you might have noticed that the picture in the background is uh, one of our local views of the Isle of Wight from our beautiful Barton Beach. Um, if you didn't notice, don't worry about it. Now, I'm not doing too well this morning. Um, I've already pinched Patrick's prayer and uh, prayed instead of him, but I've also invited Patrick to come and share a few reflections uh, on the past, so he's going to do that for us now. I came to the church in 2004 when my wife and I retired down here. I've been a pastor over the years in FIC churches. And uh, I'm just going to mention two pastors. The first one was Glyn Hampson, who was pastor when I came. He served 15 years and he, he got his last two years. And it was in some ways a difficult time for him. There were various problems. When he first came, he reckoned he discovered that some of the church officers did not even seem to be truly born again of the Spirit of God. So you can imagine it was very difficult for him. So there was that time and sorting things out. And then eventually he retired and we were looking for another pastor and the church members suggested I help them and I, uh, uh, to find someone. And I said that uh, I would want them to appoint a pastor church committee of no less than three members and they appointed two other men to serve with me in that capacity and that's how we got our present pastor Simeon and uh, when he came to preach when I told before he came I told the the members that he was 30 isn't he young well you at that time, the membership was quite small and mainly elderly. But anyway, I said, well, let's see, you know, let, let's test the Lord. And so he came and he preached and uh, they said, well, he is young, but he does preach well. And it led on from there. And eventually we called him. We heard about him through the FIC. We are grateful to the FIC for a number of things. The Fellowship of Evangelical Churches, or the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches. Two main things was looking for a pastor, and that's been a great help. The other thing was over premises. And uh, uh, just before Elizabeth and I came, uh, you've seen the photos of the uh, the new church building that had gone up just before we came so we we weren't involved with the hard work um, for that so the Lord wonderfully provided financially it was just absolutely amazing but I'm not going to go on and on about that because time is precious um, so it, the pastors are obviously important in a church, but so are faithful members. I want to mention just a few. Frank and June Chambers have been part of this church for a very long time. And then also Kathy Mitchell, another one who's also been a faithful member. And at the back there, Ian. Uh, Ian McIndoe, people like that, they stuck with the church through thick and thin. And when there were problems, and there were problems in those, what to me would be early days before I came, um, well, uh, the Lord helped right through all that. So churches depend on the long-serving members, and uh, we are grateful to all who have um, come. I, I mean, I was a newbie in 2004, having served in four churches as a pastor. So um, there we are then. That's just a sharing of, of the past. And uh, uh, those of us who 
were there back in those days. I'd been in the old building uh, uh, and worshipped there. It was put up cheaply in 1934, even before I was born. Some of you may not think there was anything that happened before, all bit prehistory, but um, it was uh, one of the windows fell out, one of the frames. It, it was put up so cheaply, there was no money to build it in a grander style but then gradually over the years the Lord's provided and so here we have this current building which has had a couple of extensions so there we are then um, I will pray I was asked to give thanks for the past and commit the future to the Lord Heavenly Father, we do know that um, prayer is so important. Forgive us that at times we forget that and try and do our own thing, and as a result, we go astray. We thank you for the way you've led those different um, men who came here, that, that group of some five who were keen to see a uh, a, a Bible gospel witness here uh, and that of course was in those difficult days and uh, we thank you for the help and support the church have had from the FIC and becoming a member of FIC in the 1940s during the wartime and so on and, and then Lord in other ways you've just helped tremendously uh, through that um, uh, through the good offices of the FIC so we thank you for doing that Lord thank you for all those blessings of the past and so we therefore confidently trust you for the future we commit it to you in our Saviour's mighty glorious name Amen, Amen. Thank you, Patrick. Well, our youngsters are going to move uh, to their session upstairs, so let's pray for them before they leave. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with younger lives. We thank you for the opportunity to bring your truth to them in their early years, and we pray that just as we have sung, you will keep them. Uh, bless those who uh, teach, bless those who guide, uh, bless their session now as they move upstairs, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Anyone going? <laughs> you stay if you like. Now I will invite Ray to join me at the front. <laughs> Sorry about the false start. No, don't worry. So this is Dr. Ray Evans, uh, his wife Jenny, uh, who's at the back with Chris. Uh, we welcome you, and Thank it's you. good to have you with us on this glorious day. Thank you. Um, thought I'd uh, seek not to embarrass you, but to ask you just to fill in a few details about yourself. So I understand, first of all, that you're now a man of leisure. Well, um, <laughs> well I, yeah, I served as a pastor in a church in Bedford for 40 years, and I retired at Christmas. And uh, I've been as busy since. <laughs> Those of you who retired will know what that means. Uh, so yeah, I'm formally no longer um, uh, leading the church, but still very much a member in the church there. So uh, I am enjoying um, some of the pressure off because it's relentless week in, week out for 40 years. So that's been quite pleasant. I've just started building a model railway for grandchildren. <laughs> We've got nine little grandchildren. So I thought if I get on with it quickly, they'll... They'll, uh, they'll get into it before they discover screens and that sort of stuff, yeah. yeah that's that's what I'm doing in my yeah. leisure, yeah. And you had a previous hobby, I understand, as well. well I seem I, to recall from visiting you in your study occasionally. Yeah, I do all kinds of things. Well, I, I love play, playing sport. It's um, one of my passions. I, I play hockey, sort of. If, if you saw us, you'd think the hockey stick was a walking stick and you've never oh, seen yeah. so much leg support on old men <laughs> in your life, but uh, I enjoy that as well, yeah. Okay, um, so what's your life looking like now? You're doing some work for the FIC? Yeah, so uh, these last few years I've been helping leaders uh, around the country 
and the FIC asked if I would do that two days a week. Uh, so I've been doing that for five or six years. And we thought that it would be wise and good and right to keep doing that. So I'm still doing that sort of work uh, two days a week. Uh, some weeks it feels like five days a week <laughs> and other weeks it's quieter. But uh, I have the privilege of working with uh, leaders and, their, and particularly leadership teams. Uh, sometimes a, an eldership would just say, look, we're thinking of this or that, of getting advice. So I, I do quite a lot of travelling with that work, but more and more of it is also on Zoom. Uh, and I've got to know lots of churches and lots of leaders all around the country, and that's a massive privilege to serve God in that way. Mm. Yeah, so, so, I, so, so this is an unscheduled question, but what, what's your understanding of the way that FIEC churches are managing these days? Lockdown was a hard time for a lot of people. Yes. What, then and now, what's been happening? Yeah, well, I, I've noticed lots of churches in the FIC are growing. So that the the narrative out there, oh, you know, Christianity is dying out, and will somebody please, you know, the last Christian turn the light out? But actually, on the ground, churches are growing, and more and more churches are facing challenges with their buildings. Their buildings are getting full. Uh, it's quite a headache to know what to do next. Uh, do we church, church plant? Do we go to two services? Or do we get another building? Mm. But I've seen churches all around the country uh, which which are growing. Uh, but but on the other side of the coin, there is a, an element which lockdown made us all a little bit inward looking and what's in it for me and how can my life be comfortable and you know relatively stress-free. And that, that's not altogether a bad thing. But it, once that becomes a, a mindset, it's what's in it for me. And... If church is based on what's in it for me, it, it, it dies. Mm. It's got to be, how can I both honour God and bless others? How can I serve? Jesus it was a servant king, and God's plan is that we be like Jesus. So we are going to become servants. Mm. Well, the, the great danger in what's in it for me is that other people serve me. And, and we've noticed around the country, more and more churches concerned about a, what... A mindset inside of us that says what's in it for me mm. whereas we need to say how can I be a blessing mm. to others so the, the two things growth and a slightly introspective self what's in it for me mm. that that's the challenge yeah. 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 yeah I know that we as a church are very uh, grateful for the work of the FIC both past and present I was looking at um, in the early years on one of our anniversaries um, uh, Paul Connor actually preached on the anniversary oh, service. Oh, wow. yeah, terrific. Uh, yeah. I can't remember which one it was. So, as the previous pastor of a church, I wrote this down so I could read it and not get it wrong. As the previous pastor of a church which grew from a membership of a few dozen to one of a few hundreds mm. at Bedford, what hints do you have for a church of our size as we look to the future to grow? Yeah, so one of the things of being in one church a very long time is you, you live with the consequences of your own mistakes, Dave, because... <laughs> Unlike management, where you just leave and go to another company before all goes wrong. When you've been in church a long time, the mistakes you make, you live with. But also, equally, you see God's good hand over a long time. The church uh, in Bedford, where I'm privileged to serve, um, was quite small when we first uh, got involved. We were involved in several church plants, and the church eventually, I guess, I guess the congregation is about five to 600 now. Uh, what would I say to a church of your size? Um, as we're going to talk later about praying for the gospel to have an effect in your area. Welcome new people, don't resent new people. One of the things I picked up is that Christians pray for the church to grow, and as soon as it does, they moan. <laughs> and, and that takes you by surprise, because you think, well, people have become Christians, or new people are coming. Isn't that lovely? But if you've been around for a while, you go, oh, I don't know them, and I don't know who's here today. And it's not as it used to be. Uh, and you, you have to fight that mindset in your mind saying, isn't it amazing? Mm. Isn't it wonderful? Mm. And I think our biggest challenge in Bedford, lots and lots of challenges over the years, but one of them is that mindset that says, I'm just so glad there are people here today who I don't know. Mm. And uh, we often tell the story of the, the church pre-Pentecost. Was a, was a group about this size, 120. They all knew each other really well. You could go and have a chat 
with the Apostle Peter. Co John would take you out for coffee. I don't kind know why thing. you're pointing at Peter. No, well, you know what I mean. But you could, yeah, yeah. There, was, there was a sort of, and we'd gone through a lot together and, you know, we'd seen amazing things. And next week, those 3,000 strangers ruined everything. You know, that, that's how Pentecost might have felt if you had been what's in it for me. Uh, and and the, the danger is, as a church of your size, is that most people know most people. And it's love to, lovely to have a, a few new people, but not too many. Because, oh, that would bring headaches. And, and yet you could say, no, that would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. Because the challenge is never how many people in the building, it's how many people outside. Yeah. And as soon as you think like that, you begin to go, Lord, whoever you bring, we will welcome. However challenging that is for us, and there'll be a time when we don't know who's in the building, we don't know everybody who's here, and that is just brilliant. Mm. That, that's the biggest challenge we faced, and I think that would be the biggest challenge you would face. Excellent. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That's really useful to know. So last question then, and then you can sit down for a while. How would you advise that we can better support and encourage our pastor? Okay, we're going to see in the passage we're looking at in a little moment. The most important thing you can do for Simeon is pray for him. Uh, there's nothing more important that you can do is to pray that God would uh, bless his ministry, uh, help him through the difficult things. There'll be loads of things going on in a pastor's world that you can't he can't tell you about. Uh, you wouldn't want him to. You you'd want to feel that you you could share things with him in confidence. Uh, but but you won't know then the most important thing you can do would be to pray for him and, and above all to pray that God's word as he brings it to you and as he ministers it personally it, it would do what God's word only can do um, you'll know the great there was a great Victorian preacher called Charles Spurgeon he saw a phenomenal you know congregation of five or six thousand and they said what was the secret of your success and he said the, the prayers of my people so the most important thing you can ever do for your pastor is is pray regularly for him mm. and, and everything he's involved in. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Okay, Thank well, you. before you sit down, Ray, <laughs> let's just pray for you and thank the you. church at Bedford and your work you. at the FIC. Lord, we, we just thank you for this servant of yours. We praise you for blessing his ministry through all of those years. Uh, we thank you for all of those who have benefited because you have worked through him and through Jenny and their family. And we pray for the church as it continues at Bedford. We pray that you will continue to help them to grow, to preach the gospel, to see others coming in and to enjoy a, a, a thriving fellowship in the love of Christ. And we pray for Ray. We ask for his work with the FIC. Thank you for the encouragement of seeing churches grow as well as churches challenged. And we commit that future to you. We pray, Lord, that you give him wisdom and discernment as he speaks to those who lead those churches. Bless him and bless his family time with Je Jenny and with the, the children and the grandchildren as well. Enrich that time with your presence. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Thank, you, Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to sing our next song, uh, another glorious song of praise, Let Your Kingdom Come. And then Andy's going to come and read from God's word for us. And uh, I've invited him too to share a few reflections uh, and uh, thoughts for us. Good morning, everybody. Well, 90 years uh, of ministry in this area. And to add into all that has been said so far about the way that God has worked through his people, I'd add one more word in, which is absolutely vital for any Christian community. And that's the word perseverance, perseverance from the early days when the folks met round the corner for prayer in the main street in those pre-war days. I'm sure it was on their minds that they would, with God, persevere into the future uh, as they sought uh, premises on the other side of the road initially uh, and then here in this lovely new building. Uh, and uh, in, in amongst that as well, of course, the grace of God. Uh, as the work has continued in this Whitefield Road branch of his church. We've already heard by the work of the Holy Spirit, faithful members from the past, uh, led by faithful pastors, have proclaimed the gospel. Uh, we had mentioned on the pictures there, for example, the Boys Brigade group uh, on the other side, 
We knew some of the folks who ran that uh, in past years. And whilst we might think that um, that sort of activity is primarily musical, uh, sporting, camping activities, we know too that the gospel was faithfully preached to those young ones. We might ask, where are those boys and girls today who heard that message? Adults, of course, probably some still living in New Milton. Can we believe even now that as we pray that God will do a work in their lives to bring them back into this building? We've already heard that numbers have increased considerably uh, in the recent decade. And that we've heard also the mention of a few people that are still here this morning who were there in those days um, quite a few years back. When Elizabeth and I joined the church in 2010, uh, leadership was in the hands of our pastor Simeon, uh, with his wife supporting him and his young children then, and with, with Patrick, um, and perhaps one or two others I can't remember. Uh, but it seemed that in those days that uh, Patrick did a lot in the church, aided by his late wife Elizabeth, and we all remember her with great affection, how she supported him. Uh, Patrick was the, uh, an elder, he combined that with being the church treasurer, uh, he also covered the emerging safeguarding role until he passed it on to me. Um, things have moved on since then, with many of you joining the church uh, in, in recent times. In some cases, if you remember, people sought the church out, a gospel-based church, uh, before they sought where they were going to live. They came to the church first and then worried about where they were going to live. Uh, <clears throat> we remember from that, that, that was because this church has the motto, taking God at his word. We might think today that's so important when we see people tampering with God's word, uh, that we take God at his word. We might add into that as well, yes, all of it. Uh, so with evangelism and a goal to make disciples a priority, Simeon spent some time in his early days working with a young man called Martin. Some of you recall this story. Martin lived in the flats across the road. He was going through a, a difficult uh, time in his personal life. He looked out of his window and saw the word free on the wall. Evangelical free church. And my understanding of this was when he saw that, that um, word, he came across here, sought out Simeon, and Simeon spent some time with him, eventually leading him to faith in Christ. Martin was an enthusiastic footballer. And together in 2012, we went to uh, that poverty-stricken country in Europe, Moldova, uh, where for a week we ran a coaching course for young boys. The pastors over there in the church seemed to have sport in their ministry quite strongly. So we went across there and spoke to over 120 lads through the week, and Martin was right in the middle of it. So as we think about that, uh, we would surely love to see more of that happening, wouldn't we, in our community, from this church. Uh, more contact with unsaved people, uh, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. People even knocking on the door of the church and wanting to come in and find out about Jesus. Would that happen? Uh, asking how they might be saved from their sin. Uh, and, you know, since this new building has been put up, we've added to the building, believe it or not, twice. We've added bits on and changed it around twice. Can we believe we would love to see souls being added to the church? We've added to the building, but wouldn't it be great to see people being added to the church? And I'm sure our, our, our goal and our, our, our setup is, is on that focus. Uh, do we mean business? We've already heard a comment about this uh, in prayer in these turbulent days. I think Ray's going to touch upon that a bit in, again in a minute. Uh, may God save us, and he's touched on this as well, uh, I've written down here, from becoming a religious club where we congregate inside, when we should be more of a witness for Jesus outside. Outside, that is, amongst the lost, those in need of our God's fatherly compassion. As I, as I say that, I'd remind us all that uh, in terms of what we do going out, that three of our men here from time to time are engaged in evangelism on the streets, how we should pray for them when they do that, engaging with people who would never come near a building. Uh, and 
we say this alongside the breakfast events for the men and now the ladies following suit, reaching people who again wouldn't come on a Sunday, but would come into these sort of types of activities. Uh, we've been, in recent years, we've been greatly encouraged with a number of younger as well as more mature people uh, being baptized. Remember the baptisms out in the car park a few years back? That was great, wasn't it? Uh, is God speaking to you about baptism if you've never been baptized? It's always encouraging to us seniors, Patrick and I, uh, uh, that members continue to serve the Lord, uh, leading the clubs, junior church, food for thought, we've had mention of that this morning, and various other activities within the church. Do pray for these people. We've heard about the importance of prayer, that God will continue to strengthen them and guide them in the work they do week after week after week uh, with that view of evangelism and reaching out to all ages that god will strengthen them and guide them so as we enter our 91st year may we look to jesus perhaps more so than we've ever done before and serve him remembering the words of that missionary from the past expecting great things from god attempting great things for god May it be so for his name's sake. So, sake. So we come this morning to our Bible reading. If you want to follow it, 1184 in the Church Bible, Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, chapter 4, uh, starting to read at verse 2. Colossians 4, verse 2. So Paul is saying to the church, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should, Verse 5, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And then the final greetings where Paul mentions many of his fellow workers. Tychius will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming <clears throat> with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus, send you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have, in, you have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings he is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of god mature and fully assured i vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at laodicea and hierapolis our dear friend luke the doctor and demas send greetings give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her home, in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. In verse 18, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you.
Well, thank you very much indeed for your invitation to come and be with you today. Can I bring to you the greetings of the church in Bedford where I serve Grace Community Church. If you have a Bible, please do turn to that passage we had read just a few moments ago. And I want to sort of ask you this question. How is your church going to reach people who don't come? It's the most, one of the most important questions that churches all around the country need to ask. How can we reach people who don't yet know Jesus as their saviour? For however many are inside, we're a tiny number compared to all those outside. There are just tens of thousands of people who live just a short distance from here who, who are not yet ready to meet God as their judge. I guess many of us were uh, fixed on our screens about that submarine and worrying like, well, what would it feel like to be two miles under the ocean and with your oxygen running out? It's a terrifying thing, wasn't it? And then we've all found out very sadly that they all died very suddenly because it, it looked like the thing imploded. But the question on our minds is, were they ready? Were they ready? And we don't know the answer. We don't know. I don't know. But it, it, it made me think all week long, what would, you, what would it be like? And Jenny, my wife, said, well, maybe give them a chance to cry out to God. Who knows what they would have heard about Jesus in the past? We don't know. But that question, it, it came very focused because the, the, there was nothing we could do for those guys two miles. Like, were they ready to meet their maker? That's the question for people around us. So each church has got to ask this question, how can, we, how can we make sure that people hear about Jesus? For, for we come today to thank God for a church that was formed because of Jesus, because of the good news about Jesus came into the world to bring God's love and forgiveness to people who've sinned against him, who've messed their lives up. It was formed 90 years ago, and today it's still saying, we don't come here to tell you about ourselves. We come, we're here to tell you the good news about Jesus. Well, that answer is found in this passage. The, the answer to that question is found in this passage. And when you first read, if you've got one of these Bibles, you'll see the heading, Further Instructions. And it looks a little bit random, doesn't it? It almost feels like, well, you know, I've got a bit of paper to fill in and here's a few random ideas. I, I, I used to write letters to my dad like that when he was uh, he was serving abroad and I would write him dad you know I've been at school and the weather's nice and then there'll be a big space at the bottom I draw a picture to fill the space in is that what this apostle's doing he's he said all the important things and now he's just got some random ideas no it's not that at all what he's been doing is is working very rationally very logically so chapter 3 verse 1 he discusses if you're a Christian, your relationship with Christ, and what is it? Well, you've not become religious. You've been raised with Christ. You have a new experience, a new relationship with God. You can now set your heart on heaven. Well, that's your home. And he talks about you and Christ and how that means that you want to put away the things that dishonor God, the evil desires. But now you're living a new life. You used to live, verse 7, you used to walk that way. You used to be uh, someone, oh, I didn't know about God. I wasn't interested. But now I do know that my sins have been forgiven. I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus. I know Jesus is God's son. He talked about you and Christ. And then very subtly, chapter, verse 8, verse 9, he goes from you and Christ and what's going on inside of your mind and your heart. To you and other Christians, verse 9, do not lie to each other. Get rid of filthy language from your lips. Now, don't lie to each other. And from verse 9, really down to verse 17, it's you and other Christians. You are now God's chosen people, verse 12. And so how do we relate to other people? We don't wind them up. We don't stir them up. What we want to do is live in true, genuine harmony. We're not perfect. We have to forgive as the Lord forgave you. A, a Christian church is not a, a whole load of people that try and be nice. It's a whole load of people who learn how to forgive because we still sin and hurt one another. 
And in that church, there ought to be deep unity. Verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule. That's like, let the peace of, our, of Christ be the referee, the, the, the umpire that blows the whistle. There should be deep unity and peace inside the church. And, and we sing God's news to one another. That's you and Christ. But then he, he looks at you at home. He talks about wives, husbands, children, parents, you at home. And then he talks about you at work. And it's OK, let's take the worst job, slave. All right. How how if you've got a, a really naff job, a really awful job, a difficult job, how do you live for Jesus as a slave? And what if you're a master? What if you're a boss? What if you're an employer? So can you see what he's doing? He's, he's, he's working through these circles. You and Christ, you and Christians, you at home, you at work. And the, the last, as it were, circle he works through the, the, is, is you and outsiders. This whole section here is about outsiders. He's been working his way through. He's thinking of all these different kinds of relationships. The central one is you and Christ, you and Christians, you at home, you at work, you and outsiders. Now, once you work that out, you see what he's doing here. This is not just random ideas. This is a carefully constructed, carefully reasoned answer to the question, how does our church, how does New Milton Evangelical Free Church reach its community? And here's the answer. And he has two things to say. Speak to God for people. That's verses two to four. Speak to God for people. And then verse five and six, speak to people for God. That's what he, that's what he has to say. There's two things. Now, preachers love three things, but they're not three things here. There are two things here. There is two big points. Speak to God for people before we speak to people for God. And that order is significant, isn't it? Before we think of how can we reach the community, we need to start speaking to God for people. Now, in verse two, the, the word, the key word is not the word praying. Although he says, Devote yourself to prayer, pray for us, pray that we might pray for him. It's an emphasis on prayer, but the key word is the word devote. He assumes if you're a Christian, you pray. It's like, does a baby cry? Well, they're alive if they cry. Do Christians pray? Well, if they don't pray, they're not a Christian. What Jesus has opened up is a new relationship with God. Of course, I'm going to speak to my heavenly father. The most famous words in the Bible, our father said on more human lips than any other words from the Bible. As soon as we come to know Christ, we can talk to God as our Father. But the emphasis on this passage is the word devote. It's a passion word. It's a priority word. It's a clear the deck of everything else kind of word. What he's saying is this. If, if you as a church and you as an individual, if you want to reach outsiders and see them become insiders, that's the, that's the great vision. I want to win as many as possible, Paul said. I want others to know what I know, God's love and forgiveness. I start by devoting myself to prayer. That is, we make it a passionate priority. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes churches have like an open time of prayer. One of my mates recently said to me, he said, Ray, have you ever thought, I said, you know, I know you shouldn't do this when other people are praying. You shouldn't be sort of, standing outside and just analyzing the prayers so i said i know that i know that you shouldn't do that but but have you ever thought about what people pray for when you have like let right we're gonna have a time of prayer and if anybody would like to lead us in prayer what do people pray for well they pray about good things lovely things they often pray you know lord may your name be glorified and so on and so forth and th 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 there's nothing wrong in those prayers but he said have you noticed what's missing i said yeah i know what's missing how many people in an open time of prayer, without being directed spontaneously, because it's a burden on their heart, pray for people who are not yet praying for themselves. He said, how many, how many times has that actually happened? I said, hardly happens at all. If, back in the uh, 60s and 70s, they used to do a thing called a time and motion study. You'd somebody come in to the factory, to the office with a, a clipboard and a stopwatch. And they'd, they'd kind of like analyze how long you spent typing the letter or how long it took to fix that bit of machinery, whatever they to try time and motion study. What if you did a time and motion study on church? 
uh, we, we stopwatch button. We, we spent 17 minutes, 37 seconds singing. We spent three minutes, 45 seconds reading the Bible. We spent too long pre no. <laughs> but you, you, now, how long did we spend praying? How long did we spend praying for people who are not yet praying for themselves? How long did we, how long did we spend praying for lost people? Your own personal prayers. If you ever saw, thought about it, how, how often and how deep and how long do I pray for lost people to be saved? And then we wonder why the church in Britain is not seeing the kind of explosive growth that churches are seeing around the world still today. It's one of the things that is a real worry to older Christians, I think, is that there is a steady decline. Although churches are growing, sadly, we are not seeing many people in their 20s and 30s becoming Christians. We're seeing people, older people becoming Christians, but that's partly some of the folks that were brought up with sort of Sunday school and church as their lives go and they begin to get to the crises of life, husband dies or, you know, the, the, the mechanic perhaps returning to their faith in their 60s and 70s. We're still seeing youngsters can, becoming Christians. But that sort of 20s and 30s, Britain is not known for explosive growth of 20-year-olds becoming Christians, but China is. If you say, what's the average age of a Christian in Britain? What's the average age in our congregation today? Will it be around... Uh, my age somewhere somewhere be you know but in china the average age would be oh the image of a christian in china is a young 20 year old it's not it isn't in britain and this passage just challenges the church in britain to pray with passion let me just take you to another passage about to illustrate this uh, if you can just turn back to romans chapter 8 And that's uh, page 1134. Romans chapter 8 is one of the great passages of the Bible. It's one of those bits where you kind of like, Whoa, wow, stop. And uh, as the apostle just looks that God's love has got us safe and secure. So he says, uh, I am convinced that he ends the chapter on this phenomenal crescendo. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you go, Phew. what happens then? Well, let me tell you what happens then. Preachers close the sermon then and then say, do you know what? Romans is quite a long book. It's 16 chapters long. We're halfway through. We'll have a break because actually chapters 9, 10 and 11 are really difficult. So we'll come back to that in six months time. That's what happens all around the country. Preachers come to the end of Romans 8 and it's such a high point. You go, Whoa, wow, nothing can separate us from the love of God, Christ Jesus. Our and this is what happens. You miss the next emotional note. What is the next emotional note? What is the thing you should feel when you know that you're secure in the love of God? What is the thing you should feel the most? Well, keep reading. Because he didn't write it with chapters. He just wrote. And the very next thing he says this. Nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Can you see that? I am, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ, but I wish I could be cursed if that would make a difference to the people I love to bits who are not yet forgiven. See that? The first thing he doesn't feel is hallelujah. The first thing he feels is broken heart. If you know you're forgiven, you can't help but think of somebody's unforgiven. Especially if their DNA courses and their blood courses through your blood. If, if they're your own. 
And for some of you here this morning, it will be a son or a daughter or a grandchild. It might be a mum. It might be a spouse. You have people around you you love to bits. And in some ways, the thought of eternity is so packed, you, you blot it out. You blot it out because it's almost too difficult to cope with. That's what he is expressing after this great crescendo. He is not embarrassed to say, you know what? I have a broken heart about people who don't know yet the same love that I know. And what does he do about it? Well, he tells us in chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites as they may be saved. Now, here's the thing. Romans 9, 10 and 11 have some of the most exalted teaching of what we call the sovereignty of God, the, the God being in control of eternity that you can find in the whole of the Bible. But for the apostles, he teaches that God is in control. That does not go against the thought he's a broken heart and he prays to God that people might be saved. We can tell God, Father, I, I just love my son, my daughter, my grandkids, my neighbours, my work. I love them to be saved. Father, I can't imagine what it would be like. I know, like, I know that my sin deserves your judgment. You could have judged me and I would have had no complaint. But instead of that, you forgave me. But I'm no better than they are. It's not because I was somebody special. It's because you showed me great mercy. And the lesson is, if you can show me great mercy, you surely can show them the same mercy. That's, that's what's powering this man's heart. So when he says, devote yourselves to prayer, he isn't just like, oh, just pray a little bit more, would you? What he's saying is, do you feel like that? about people you love because that's how he feels do you feel like that this morning in one sense as we thank god for our church we should be thinking of all the people that like you mentioned andy mentioned about the young boys uh, did you see when i looked at the picture my boys went to one of those thinking yeah what about those young boys now what would it be like to have heard about jesus when you were eight nine ten and then ignore him for 50 or 60 years, but Lord, one, it would, Lord, I can't imagine what it would be like if they died and the Lord Jesus said, but you heard about me. Why did you not believe in me? That's what he's talking about. And if a church wants to see boys from the boys brigade become Christians 50 years later, it's got to devote itself to prayer. And it's not just more. You know, it's one of the great dangers, isn't it? Uh, there's a thing, a guy wrote an article going, preachers always have application. It's five mores. Pray more, give more, come more, tell more people about Jesus, read the Bible more. And you, you, once you start listening for it, you go, oh, okay, this is number three more out of the five. You know, there's always do more, do more, do more. And then normally, and in a way that's right, sort of. But what he wants this passage to do to us really is to let it touch our hearts so that we begin to engage with it at a deeper level. The Lord Jesus wept over a city that was going to crucify him. Maybe what we need to say, Lord, just touch my heart about people I love. When we talk about reaching people with Jesus, oh, you know, I'm not very good at that. Well, don't worry about, just start with the people you love and start praying for them with a passion. Let, let that passion get to you. Say, yeah, I am forgiven. They're not forgiven. Well, let that fuel you. Just say, Father, I can't imagine what would it be like to die unforgiven? Now, he's not just pressing an emotional button. Don't get me wrong. He's not, he's not manipulating you. But what he's doing is challenge this, challenging this church to say, Look, this is where it starts. It starts with you on your own, with your heavenly father, telling him about people you love to bits and not giving him any rest. One of the ladies in our church, um, she became a Christian a little while ago. I then asked her how old she was as we baptized her because she was of a certain age, as it were. 
And then two years later, it was her 80th birthday. Like, oh, my goodness. Pat was baptized at 78. Pat had started coming to church two years before she got baptized. And she said to me, Ray, I, it's made me a better person. I, I like coming to church because it made me a better person. Like, oh. But two years later, Ray, I've got it. I'm a sinner and Jesus died for me. And here's the thing. Pat was the mum of one of our church elders called Chris. Chris was converted when I started coming to the church in 1978. He'd prayed for his mum for 35 years. 35 years! Well, I can tell you, his eyes were blubbing up at her baptism. He'd never seen anything like it. His mum was saved after 35 years of praying for her. Here's the thing, his dad is now 91. He's not yet saved. We're still praying for Peter. And the whole church felt the power of that. You're thinking, Chris, you prayed for your mum. For... God, forgive me that I've not prayed. Perseveringly, with passion and hope and trust that you could do what I can't do. That's what this church is being challenged to here in Colossae. It's only a small church. It's not, it's not Rome. It's not Ephesus. It's not Corinth. It's Colossae. Say, you're not Bournemouth. You're New Milton. But he's saying to a church like yours, Devote yourselves to prayer. Almost as if there's nothing else you get from this morning. Let this get to you till you give God no rest. I can't, Father, I can't stop praying. Please remember. And you will all have names. In fact, the more you think about it, you'll have many names. Many, many names. And then he asks and pray for preachers. That's why I said pray for Simeon. Church, pray, but pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, that we may proclaim the mystery and pray that I may proclaim it clearly. Pray for preachers to have opportunities and pray for preaching to have an effect. Uh, what an opportunity it was for Simeon to have a guy over the road turn up and say, tell me about the word free. Well, OK, let me tell you about the word evangelical then. <laughs> But what, what an opportunity. Those things like, how did that happen? Well, that's God at work, isn't it? There's times when it's just bizarre how God works. Pray that God would open doors. Paul was chained at that point. He was in prison. Pray that even in prison, I might have open doors. And if we had time, we would look at how God did that. And pray for preaching that it might be clear. Now, I think there's two ideas there i don't think paul is saying you know i'm such a muddlehead i go all over the place i think what he wants is is i want it i want the big things to be crystal clear that i might not ever be afraid to say the things that are going to challenge the culture but also when i speak would it be clear to my hearers i remember a policeman once saying in his conversion he said my wife became my, my mother-in-law became a christian i thought uh oh then my wife became a Christian, I thought, uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh, uh, and they both dragged me along to hear a Christian preacher called Lewis Palau. And he said, I didn't want to go. But the moment that man began to speak, it was like my head was in a vice. And I couldn't do anything other than listen. And I just saw it as clear as Christ. Now, what is that? It's God at work, isn't it? You want to pray for Simeon, pray for that God would give him opportunities and pray that when he preaches, there would be God's power. So people say, Pastor, you were talking to me today. Pray for preachers. OK, so that's where we start. Now, here's the thing. That is doable, isn't it? You could begin to change the habits of your prayer life so that you began to devote yourselves passionately to praying more than you have in the past for lost people. That's not out of sight, is it? That's not like only a big church like Lansdowne Road can do this. Right? This is not Hillsongs or HTB. This is us. We could, we could pray with more passion and more conviction and more concern for lost people than we do. That's what he says. Speak to God for people. Then, then he moves, change tack in verse five. He then starts looking at how you speak to God, uh, speak to people for God. 
Notice what he says. It's quite remarkable, isn't it? The first thing he says is not, okay, who's going to sign up? We're going to go out on the street now. That's not what he does. For many of us, we feel this is where we are at our weakest, patheticest of Christian. Like the word, if, if ever a pastor says, I'm going to preach on evangelism, you kind of go like that, like that. But in the heart, you go, oh, no, not another. Oh, I, I'm useless. I'm just useless at this. I know what you feel like. I remember when I, that I first became a Christian. I was from a non-Christian background. The church I went to, we did what was called door-to-door -door work. It's like you knocked on doors. I used to pray that people would be out. I used to, I used to find it so embarrassing. I'm, I'm a shy introvert. It felt like, you know, put, fucking your fingers. I'm putting them in the socket. I didn't feel it was very helpful. Now, that was way, way back in the, you know, 70s. How much more cold calling is regarded as like no no today and if you think that evangelism is like you somehow just got to become a weirdo and just do it no notice what he says be wise the first thing he says after all that passion and all that sort of sense of does this touch your heart and are you praying to god the first thing he says is not over the top into action and certain death no, he says, be wise. You can be who you are. Christianity is not fanaticism. We are not at a sales pitch where I'm trying to teach the sales team how to get more sales so the, the, the second quarter figures go up better. No, we're Christians. And we can be wise. We know who they are. They know who we are. We know if we're shy, if we're extrovert, we know what. We're all very different. We don't have to force ourselves into some sort of mold, which I am not. We don't have to crank it up and artificially. I've got a friend, he's, he's delightful, but if he hasn't talked to somebody about Jesus during the day, he feels really guilty. So sometimes he finds himself at half nine at night going for a takeaway that he doesn't really want just to talk to somebody about Jesus before he could go to sleep at night. Look, you don't have to be like that. You could be wise. If you've had your tea at seven, you do not need a takeaway at half eight just so that you could, do you know what I mean? You don't have to throw tracks out the window just to calm the conscience. No, you can be wise. What a relief. A church doesn't have to be fanatical. It can be wise. But then notice the, the tension, the balance. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, but make the most of every opportunity. Make the most of every opportunity. God gives you opportunities. Then at that point, don't take a cowardly way out. Take a courageous way in. And I know this, but I'm still so tempted to take a cowardly way out. A few years ago, we were down, I was born in near Plymouth, and we visited my own little home village. I'd been at a conference speaking about reaching people for Jesus. And we were on this little beach outside of Newton Ferris uh, near Plymouth. And uh, it was October time, so it was quite quiet. And Jenny and I were there, it was a nice day. And this guy came along, he was fishing. And he walked by and he came back about half an hour later. He said, oh, what, you, what brings you down here? And, and I said, oh, it's my home village. And I'm just visiting for old time. So I learned to swim down there and that sort of stuff. And, and my, then Jenny said, and she's like, he, he's where you are. And Jenny's there and I'm here. And he looks at me and says, oh. And she says, oh, actually, he's, he's a Christian pastor. And um, he, he's, he's been down in this area telling people about Jesus. Oh, he said, so you're a fisher of men, he said to me. And she looks at me like daggers. Look, he's put it on a plate. Fisher of men, go on. And I said, yeah. And then off he went. And she said, how could you do that? Could you do that? Well, God must be both merciful and a sense of humour because he came back an hour later. And he was, he walked by, he said, so you're a fisher of men. And I thought, Lord, I've got it. Yes. <laughs> I give me a thank you for the second chance. So we had a conversation. It turned out his mother had been a Methodist and he had been anti. And we had a conversation about 35. I wish I'd been clearer. I wish I'd been bolder. I know how pathetic I am. But I just need to recognize, Ray, God is not there to punish you. 
when he opens up an opportunity. He's there giving opportunities because that's how people get saved. And sometimes it might be a stranger on a seashore and sometimes it might be a colleague in a sports club and sometimes it might be a neighbour at Christmas and sometimes it might be a son whose life is in a mess. There's all kinds of opportunities and that point, it isn't about how clever you are, it's about trusting God that he has opened an opportunity and you're like, I'm your servant, Lord. Ask a question. Talk about Jesus. You can't go far wrong. Make the most. The, the, the little word there is, is from the Greek marketplace, the Agora. You can do this because I watch you do it. Some of you eBay people, you, people on eBay tell you how many incredible market, Facebook marketplace. So, some of you do this sort of stuff. You're really good at it. My son is incredible. He's always telling me what bargains. Uh, for you, it might be the market. You know the market. Uh, do you, in bed, we have a market. What's the best time to buy things cheap? When the market traders are getting twitchy about half an hour before they've got to pack up the stall. They see all this stock. The market closes in half an hour. And you just watch them over the next quarter of an hour. Boy, do they sweat. Then all of a sudden they say, okay, this box of oranges for you, madam, a pound for the lot. He said, well, there was a pound and orange this morning, but now it's a pound for the box because they don't want to take it home. It's a bargain. Well, we can do that, can't we? Well, Paul says, have that same energetic mindset when God opens an opportunity. But then notice, not only use the opportunity, which is dealing with our, our courage, but then... What do you say? Verse six, let your conversation be always full of grace. Notice that. How you speak comes before what you say. And you know that's important, don't you? If you say, I love you, nobody heard love. They just heard anger. If our tone is aggressive, combative, dismissive, superior, inferior. If we come over as smarmy, self-righteous, telling people off, the tone really matters. So let your conversation be always full of grace. He's not saying let your conversation be full of the doctrines of Christian grace. He's being gracious. What he means is this. People will say rubbish this way. You return grace. You show them love they don't deserve it might come with a load of expletives it might come as if they really hate you respond with grace respond with grace you'll know too many churches have had splits and they look back and they go i don't know what the issue was about but i do remember the nastiness in which people spoke to each other let your conversation be always full of grace, full of love and mercy and patience and kindness. But that is not doormat walk all over me, seasoned with salt. What he means there, say something worth saying, seasoned with salt. Uh, salt's a flavour. I love crisps. There's one flavour, beats them all. Walker's cheese and onion. By miles, once they're open, that's it. Do you want to make a happy man? Walker's cheese and onion. Because there's something, you know that phrase, Moorish? They're Moorish because the more you have, the more you want. They're Moorish. Well, let your conversation be like that. I'd like to hear you again about this, they said to Paul at Athens. We'd like to hear you again. Can you tell us more? You can't go far wrong when you tell them about how important Jesus is to you. You may not be, you know, you're, oh, well, he says here, so that you may know how to answer everyone. What he means by that is not you've got an answer for every question, but if you, if you are kind, thoughtful, good listener, gracious, and you point them to Jesus, you will have answered everyone. Okay? So he's not saying any philosophical question they've got, you've got the answer up your sleeve. No, no, he doesn't mean that at all. He means if you live like this, you will have answered and then what comes? Well, a full stop. A full stop. What he's saying is that's it. 
If your church, New Milton Evangelical Free Church, devotes itself to prayer for lost people, and each one of us is saying, Lord, if you could use me today, please do so. I'm weak, but you're strong. The message is not me, it's about you. Help me to be patient and kind and forgiving and bear with people around me. Help me not to come over as superior, judging them for their messed up lives. Help me to recognize the message is one of salvation for sinners. The church can trust God with the results. The church can just leave it there with the Lord. If you devote yourselves to prayer, if you speak to God for people, and as God gives each of us opportunities, live before and speak before others, that's how the church grows. It's how the church grows in Britain today. Ordinary people, ordinary Christians, inviting their friends to things, talking about Jesus, pointing them to the Savior, bringing them sometimes to church, doing one-to-one -one Bibles, all kinds of ways. But it's individual Christians like you and me just living like this. That's how the church grows. We can trust God with the results. And that is such a relief, isn't it? It's such a relief that a little church can trust God with this eternally significant impact on people's lives. And those of you who've been here for a while will go, we've seen it. We've seen that tiny little group of five grow through ups and downs. And now this building has had to be extended and extended. And, and now, wow, the church probably has never been the size it is now. Wow. But what if God doubled it? That would only be one person for each of us who we love to bits becoming a Christian. The church would double. Wow. What, what, what could that happen? Well, why not? The church can leave that with the Lord. So may the Lord encourage you as you think about the people around you you love to bits. To take home from this passage huge encouragement to live for God. David, thank you. Well, thank you, Ray. What a word, what a challenge. There are prayer meetings this week in this mm. church. There are prayer times in our home groups. Come and pray with us. Let's pray. Faithful God, may the glorious gospel of the glorious Christ be so burning bright in our hearts that we cannot be silent. May it show in our lives that they may show forth the fruit of him in our hearts so that glory might be brought to him. We pray for opportunities and we pray for boldness to take them. And now may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. Amen.